I'd like to briefly describe a little bit what I've done in the clinic and in the lab, and, but, but mostly at the end, uh, I'd like to also give you uh, perhaps uh, a, a, a vision uh, presentation on where uh, do we think uh, we are going to be doing, uh, we're going to be going in terms of the development of, of new therapeutics. I think uh, we all would agree that although there may be some surprises and yes, chemotherapy may still play a role, I think that we all believe that classical approaches to cancer therapy may have reached a plateau. And this was something that was touched upon this morning very nicely, I thought, by um, uh, Bill Sellers. I wanted to put some examples but I, I did not want to hurt any company's feelings, so I'm just having a non-company slide. Uh, but I think uh, what is clear is that uh, until now, uh, empirical approach to clinical trial design is what uh, has been done for most part. And that means that uh, new ideas have been tested in an unselected uh, patient population. We have like an unawed appro an un -on approach. So basically what we have been doing is that when we had an idea with a new agent, we just added that to whatever was the standard therapy, and this has resulted in the triplets and even quadruplets uh, with all kind of things. And then also, the implication of this type of uh, uh, unselective approach, if you wish, is large clinical trials. And I am totally, totally terrified about the size of the clinical trials, and I hope we are not gonna take the road of our friends in other uh, indications in medicine. I was just told recently that there are some ongoing clinical trials in cardiovascular medicine that have over 25,000 patients. I mean, can you imagine uh, doing a clinical trial in oncology, uh, enrolling 25,000 patients? So I think we hope we should be able to hide away from this. This approach has uh, led to heart failure rate, and, and, and I think that's known by all of us, the totally, uh, I think, unacceptable heart failure rate of many of our clinical trials and or minimal benefit. We're talking about some large trials that, yes, they reach the statistical endpoint, but the question is not whether the study is significant, but whether if the study gives you a clinically meaningful benefit, and the answer is no. A month, a few weeks of a survival uh, of progression free survival benefit, I don't think represents a uh, minimum full uh, clinical benefit, and probably we should not bother with that. And then, of course, high cost. You know, when you do uh, these complex trials with a very high failure rate, then the cost uh, of development uh, and the cost for the system are very, very high. So I'd like to uh, go back in uh, uh, what, what was the birth of. Um, my own approach to targeted therapies. Many people have uh, asked questions, what's the definition on, what, what was the time point where targeted therapies were born? Probably they were born, um, uh, you know, from the very beginning, uh, especially with the targeting of ER uh, in breast cancer. But I think in this new era, I think uh, perhaps the clock has to be set in the mid in the mid 80s with uh, beginning mid 80s with the cloning of the oncogenes and i think clearly a family that was up there uh, with initial cloning was the uh, the egf receptor uh, family of receptors um, I was um, as a fellow uh, in the laboratory of uh, john mendelson at that time uh, john had produced uh, in his lab a number of antibodies against the egf receptor the hypothesis was that uh, these uh, antibodies were going to be useful in tumors expressing EGF receptor and or a number of their ligands. And we began to work with some of the murine components of these antibodies. And in these slides, you have two of them, 225 and 528. And to make the long story short, multiple studies and multiple publications, we showed clearly that the antibody uh, that later on became setuximab was active in uh, epidermoid uh, cell lines. We did not, we were not able uh, to, at that time in the late 80s, beginning of the 90s, to identify what specific features uh, were determining a sensitivity uh, to, these, um, to these antibodies. But suffice it to say, uh, a number of epidemiological lines were sensitive, and we conducted a lot of studies uh, with uh, chemotherapy. Now, interestingly, and that's the that's slide here, uh, the initial grant that was written and that the initial proposal was that EGFR antibodies would work in breast cancer, if you can imagine that. And I'll come back to you in a minute, another minute, in a few, in a few slides about this. And the initial studies in breast cancer were stopped at Memorial Sloan Kettering 
and I don't know if you know why, but the reason why they were stopped is because patients with breast cancer developed a skin rash that was felt to be unbearable. Those same patients, 10 years later, if they don't get a skin rash, they get upset. Uh, so it's all about understanding uh, some of the side effects that, uh, that, 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 that occurred with some of these agents. And clearly, um, in some of the models, uh, such as squamous carcinomas of the head and neck and, and other models, yeah, if you gave appropriate doses of both of chemotherapy and antibodies against um, the EGF receptor, you could get uh, tumor eradication, such in this model by, by Senfan, uh, in, um, in, uh, that you can see that actually patient, the animals were being cured. So clearly, this was hopeful. And that led to the initial phase one uh, clinical trials. Uh, a, a warning sign, uh, this trial uh, was famous for a variety, of thing, uh, a variety of things. The most famous one uh, is, uh, it was a study that was sponsored by IMCLON. Um, the most interesting scientifically thing is that we made in this trial a terrible mistake that delayed uh, enrollment, uh, they delayed the process for about a year and a half. We had, in the laboratory uh, uh, models, data that suggested that if we reach it, uh, trough serum concentration of more than 20 nanomolar of the antibody, we would achieve maximal uh, inhibition of the receptors. And that was achieved at about a dose of, I don't know if there's a pointer here. Uh, does anybody have a pointer? Yeah, so we, that, that, that dose was at around 100 milligrams per meter square per week. And when we stopped, the, so we reached that, the antibodies were expensive to, 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 be, to produce them. So we said we are happy, we have reached what we wanted to reach. And then there was a very smart pharmacologist that said, guys, you're making a mistake here. You have not reached... Uh, saturation of clearance, and there's a lot of EGF receptors in the body, and unless you achieve saturation of clearance, you're not going to be uh, in the right uh, concentration ballpark, and that basically what we did is that we had to reopen the trial, and then we were able to find the dose uh, that was in between here, that was the dose that's been moved forward. So um, clearly the importance of paying attention to all the features um, of a given drug in a in a, in a uh, you know, in, in early development uh, is critical. And I'm wondering how many good drugs uh, we have thrown away just by not doing the right phase one study and not doing and finding the right, uh, uh, the right dose and schedule. Uh, we then move on, and, and, and this was work that I did already in uh, Barcelona. Uh, basically, uh, people felt at that time that head and neck cancer was not an indication where you could develop new agents, and yet, uh, the level of expression of EGF receptor in uh, head and neck tumors was very high, and we showed that there was a tight correlation between EGF receptor expression and activating MAP kinase uh, in our uh, tumor biopsies. And then we began a number of studies uh, with cetuximab uh, in head and neck, and uh, here is just the list. Uh, basically, we showed that uh, cetuximab was active in, in, in head and neck, uh, either alone or in combination uh, with uh, chemotherapy. And this, together with the data with radiation therapy, uh, led to the approval of cetuximab in patients with head and neck uh, cancer. At the same time, um, the uh, HER2 receptor also had uh, been uh, cloned by three groups, one of them uh, in Boston. And um, Genentech um, was beginning to produce antibodies against against her too. And the concept was quite similar, although we knew at that time less about the receptor biology of HER2 than each receptor. The concept of using an antibody to hit HER2 uh, was also uh, very, very attractive. And we began to work in the lab uh, um, to uh, develop antibodies against HER2. And uh, what would, would, the one that we worked initially was 4D5. And 4D5, uh, was the chimeric, uh, uh, was the, uh, uh, the murine uh, precursor of, of, of testuzumab. And we started the initial phase one clinical trials back in 1992. And then uh, the story of testuzumab uh, is well known uh, to you all. 
um, there's some interesting concept I'd like to, to put forward to. In the same time that 45 was produced, there was another antibody that had the similar inhibitory capacity than 45, and it was called 2C4. And that antibody was not developed, and that antibody now is pertuzumab, that you may be familiar with. So pertuzumab was in the same batch of antibodies that 45 was in the beginning. And uh, we began to see some uh, clinical responses also, not in the phase one, uh, in the phase two. And uh, I'd like to use this slide to make a point. Uh, this uh, was a patient of mine that was reported in the initial publication uh, in 1996, or the phase two study. And interestingly enough, uh, do you know how many responses did we observe in the phase one study with Rosuzumab? Zero. And uh, we had some hits of responses, but responses were not uh, durable. They did not fulfill any criteria. And in the face, the reason for that is that we were not selecting patients right. So we were having patients that had one plus, two plus, and three plus overexpression. Now, in the phase two setting, that's a study. We had two plus, but the majority were three plus overexpressors, and yet we had a 12% response rate. So I think that um, sometimes when people get discouraged, and I remember when there was at San Antonio that they had the first presentation, I had a very angry person coming to the, podium, to the microphone and saying, why are you making such a big deal um, you know, with an antibody that only has a 12% response rate? Well, um, it's a big deal. And I think uh, what's happening is that uh, when you see a signal um, in early disease, uh, in early development uh, in patients with advanced disease, um, it is likely that these therapies will make a profound impact uh, later on. So when people say that what we're seeing with PA3 canis is not that exciting, well, I have news. We are seeing more responses in the PA3 canis inhibitor field than we had with HER2 in the initial setting. So it's all about learning and improving our odds. And now, uh, the estimated number of lives that have been saved with Herceptin in Europe, uh, it's over 30,000 patients. So it's not, it's not a small, it's not a small uh, number. Uh, we were also uh, working at that time, uh, working on synergism between chemotherapy. It was clear in our model that plaquitaxel was uh, the, the best one when it came to synergism. Uh, uh, with Zosumab far better than cisplatin uh, in our hands. And this was the basis to incorporating uh, plaquitaxel uh, to the pivotal study that uh, led to the regulatory approval of uh, Tersusumab. Uh, now, the field in HER2 has changed tremendously. Uh, this is the list of agents uh, that are currently in clinical development, or some of them are already approved, that have activity against HER2. So we have moved from having no agent in less than 15 years to have more agents that we can possibly study. And I'd like to uh, call uh, your attention to some of these agents that are showing um, a very good activity. And uh, we're talking about pertuzumab, I'll talk to you about in a minute, uh, TDM1, uh, then the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, mTOR inhibitors together with anti her therapy also quite active, HSP-19 inhibitors, and I think here perhaps is the weakest link. The data uh, uh, is from phase two data, is from phase two studies, and I think we are hoping um, to see what's happening with some of the advanced disease, uh, uh, with some of the advanced clinical trials. Now, this is a busy slide, but uh, what I'd like to uh, call your attention is onto the results um, uh, part. This is the overall response of the different compounds. And if you look at TDM1, which you will see in a minute, in patients that are refractory to, uh, to Susumab, response rates uh, over 20% seen in multiple trials, Pertusumab the same, combination with, uh, uh, um, with, uh, with, with, with Lapatinib and and, and Herceptin also, high clinical benefit. So I think, and, and also new generation of of um, uh, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So I think we're talking about agents that have a good deal of clinical activity. Uh, we were very interested in working with uh, pertuzumab uh, because pertuzumab had a different mechanism of action than trastuzumab. Uh, the, the crystallography of this has been, will, uh, has been uh, well figured out. Trastuzumab binds to the domain four of the extracellular portion of the receptor, and it interferes mostly with ligand-independent HER2 activation. On the other hand, pertuzumab binds to the domain two. That's the dimerization domain where HER3 and HER2 get together. And pertuzumab is critically important 
in uh, inhibiting uh, ligand um, dependent activation. There was data that suggested that pertuzumab was active in patients uh, in tumors that were HER2 overexpressors, and yet the initial development of pertuzumab was done in low HER2 overexpressions, and there were no responses. The activity was very um, minimal, and we fought very hard to study pertuzumab in combination with trastuzumab in the advanced setting in patients that have failed uh, trastuzumab. And um, that's the, um, uh, uh, I, I won't go into the details, uh, but basically we have seen a 25% response rate uh, in this uh, phase two uh, clinical trial. What we did in that initial phase two trial uh, that is to us quite interesting is that once we saw the responses with the combination, we addressed whether pertuzumab alone would be active. And basically we saw very minimal response. So we had patients that had progressed on trastuzumab, we stopped trastuzumab, we added pertuzumab, and response rate was very low. Then what we did as part of the same study was a new cohort, uh, patients that had progressed on trastuzumab and had progressed on pertuzumab, we added the two together. And the response rate that we see in there is 25%. So it's absolutely fascinating. I don't know, this we could discuss later, but I don't know if there's any example in oncology when you have patients that are progressing on two separate uh, compounds, when you give them together, you see a response. And I think that speaks to the biology of HER2 and to the importance of blocking uh, the two mechanisms of HER2 activation. So Pertuzumab is going ahead. This is the Cleopatra study. Um, this is um, the registration first line study. Uh, it's fully accrued, and we should have results by the end of, um, sorry, by mid-2011. So um, this is a classical design, but in this case it makes sense because we are adding Pertuzumab to the standard um, uh, combination um, uh, regimen. And then, um, I think uh, something that this pertuzumab story is telling us is the importance of combining uh, therapies uh, that have partially non-overlapping mechanisms of action. And in the case of HER2, there is another example that I would like to uh, um, show to you, which is the combination of trastuzumab and a small tyrosine kinase um, inhibitor. And uh, this combination has been shown by multiple groups that... Um, they, it's very synergistic in all the models. Uh, this is data from, from, from our lab, but the others. We have a proposed mechanism of action. Um, uh, lapatinib, what it does is that it um, inhibits the degradation of HER2. Uh, the degradation of HER2 is mediated uh, via uh, eutonization and only occurs when the kinase, uh, action, uh, uh, the kinase ro uh, function is active. So we have an increase in the amount of her to in the cell surface uh, uh, in, in, in experimental models, and maybe that increases ADCC, we don't know, but anyway, the synergy is there. And what's um, also important is that uh, we have uh, uh, another potential uh, explanation. Um, there is about one third of tumors that overexpress HER2 that have a truncated version of the receptor that we call P95. And this truncated version of the receptor is very oncogenic and has a very active tyrosine kinase. And antibodies do not work uh, in that setting. So, um, and on the other hand, lapatinib does work and very well. So that could be an additional explanation why uh, we see this uh, 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 synergy. And I think a very good clinical experiment is this clinical trial that uh, was chaired by Joyce O'Shaughnessy and by Kim Blackwell. And this was in patients with advanced HER2 disease um, that had progressed on trastuzumab and patients were randomized to lapatinib alone or lapatinib plus trastuzumab. The study was positive in favor of the uh, combination and not only at improving the progression-free survival, but actually at improving survival. And I think that this is yet another proof that uh, combined uh, anti-HER2 um, uh, therapies are probably going to be better than uh, just a single agent. And um, also important is that we can develop um, agents that are non-toxic and that uh, don't contain um, uh, chemotherapy. And I think that would be a, a major advance. And we are studying this in the adjuvant setting. This is a large study, uh, eight 
thousand patient study that is almost uh, enrolled. Uh, that was done under uh, the collaboration of the Press International Group and the North American groups. It's called ALTO. And here um, you see multiple arms. It's complex to follow. But this trial is a study in the adjuvant setting that is comparing trastuzumab alone to lapatinib alone to the combination of both, either given together or given uh, sequentially. In addition, um, we have arms with taxanes, arms without taxanes, and even we have a component in which we are including the CTH uh, regimen. So hopefully this study will address whether a combined uh, anti therapy is beneficial in the adjuvant um, setting. Now, um, looking at the mechanism of resistance uh, in the field of HER2 is what led us to our interest in uh, uh, exploring uh, alterations in the PI3 uh, kinase uh, pathway. Uh, I'm not going to dwell into that. You've seen these slides already presented by uh, Luke and Lee uh, this morning. But the, the point is that in patients with HER2 overexpression, and this is an outdated slide from the one that Luke and Lee presented this morning, about 20% of patients that are HER2 positive, uh, they do um, have uh, mutations on the PI3 kinase gene. And there is data in the clinic from the group of René Bernards and also from our own group that suggests that if you are a HER2 positive tumor uh, that has a PI3 kinase mutation, um, there will be an increased resistance to upstream blockade with anti-HER2 agents. So I think clearly that's a mechanism of resistance that plays a role in the clinic. And uh, this is just to uh, show some of the data from uh, one of the uh, uh, investigators in my lab, and that's uh, Pete uh, Einhorn, who came from René Bernard's lab uh, initially. And uh, this is working, uh, this is data uh, showing that in cell lines with some of the um, uh, mutations on the PSV kinase gene, as you hear, as you see here in the, in the bottom, uh, these cells are resistant to trastuzumab and to lapatinib when you compare them to the, uh, uh, to the parental uh, control uh, cell line. So <clears throat> now the good news, and you've heard also this morning, well, the complex news more than good news is that we have a lot of compounds uh, that we can study and that are currently being studied in the clinic that, that uh, target uh, the PI3 uh, kinase pathway. So basically we have pure pan PI3 kinase inhibitors. Uh, it's not in this slide. We have now alpha-specific inhibitors. We have dual inhibitors that block PI3 kinase and mTOR. We have catalytic mTOR inhibitors. Uh, we have AKT inhibitors on top of the Rapalox, uh, such as uh, Epidolimus, uh, that uh, you know. And uh, these clinical trials are ongoing and um, are still early days. Uh, but we're beginning to see some interesting uh, results in the phase one um, uh, study. This was presented at ASCO this year, and uh, what we're looking here is at the metabolic response uh, that we see with these uh, um, uh, patients, and we do see nice metabolic responses. Now, is this a surrogate effect of the drug getting there, or is that an indication on of anti-tumor activity? Well, that's a very good um, uh, item for discussion. But it's important that those patients that have a measurable response by conventional residual criteria, all these patients have a PET response. So one of the things that we've been talking um, is that perhaps PET could be used. Well, PET is fundamentally important for these studies, and we should incorporate imaging uh, into all of them. But then also maybe PET could be used as a biomarker of enrichment, and perhaps before randomizing patients into receiving uh, uh, therapy with a PA3 kinase or not, maybe what could be done is um, first enrich and only uh, go on with patients that have a PET response, uh, because otherwise the likelihood of these patients benefiting is probably uh, very, uh, very minimal. So this could be used as an enrichment strategy. There are some responses that we don't understand uh, or that are difficult to understand, such as the one that Luke only presented on the exact clinical trial. And this was the patient with triple negative breast cancer that had a KRAS mutation. Although, uh, if you think about it, um, uh, uh, you know, KRAS signals uh, via PI3 kinase, and maybe it's not the same uh, breast cancer with a KRAS mutation that a, that, that a colon cancer with a KRAS mutation or a lung cancer. But we also are beginning to see responses in patients with PI3 kinase mutation. And this is a patient from ours. 
And uh, here what we have been is have been very careful at doing biopsies. And in this particular patient, we have good tumor biopsies before therapy. And also we were able to obtain a tumor tissue uh, when the patient progressed uh, from therapy. So I think these type of resources should be very valuable to identify uh, what are the mechanisms of acquired resistance. And we're very excited about, about, about this. And then uh, I mentioned in the beginning that we had proposed that EGF receptor was a potential target in breast cancer. And this was the initial grant. Actually, this was an initial support grant that was funded uh, uh, for the breast group at, at Memorial. And the question that whether EGF receptor plays a role in breast cancer, I think, is an important one. Uh, we know that there is a subset of tumors that express EGF receptor. These are the basal-like. And there have been some studies that had suggested that uh, anti-EGFR anti therapies may play a role in uh, breast cancer. There was a study by Lisa Carey that was difficult to interpret just because um, what she did uh, is that patients were randomized to receive cetuximab plus carbo versus cetuximab alone, and, and that is difficult to really um, get a feeling. And then there was a study by US oncology that was led by Joyce, in which you had a subgroup of patients that you gave cetuximab uh, together, I believe it was carbo, Car yeah, in Utican, and uh, yeah, and also in in, in just a group of patients, you did have uh, in benefit uh, with the addition of cetuximab, which was quite interesting. We thought so. Building on this, we conducted the Bali study. Uh, this is a study that we presented at the ESMO meeting about two weeks ago. Uh, patients with triple negative breast cancer uh, were randomized to receive cisplatin alone or cisplatin plus cetuximab. And this is what we observed. So we observed a significant improvement in progression-free survival in this patient population. Now, uh, this study has a number of issues that are important. First of all, is a randomized phase two, so it's not a randomized phase three. Second, we were surprised and very surprised by the poor performance of the control group. So as you see, the control group uh, only had a progression free survival of 1.45 months. So although we had more than doubling, um, uh, uh, we had questions on, 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 on what to do with this. And also the response rate, we doubled. It went from 10% to 20%. I do think, though, that it would be worthwhile to continue to explore uh, anti of our therapies in triple negative breast cancer. I think there is a signal. This is a signal as strong as you can get. So I think um, this is something that uh, we feel uh, uh, pretty positive. So let me uh, move to the second part of, of my talk. I think, um, wh where are we right now? I think that we are at a point in the field where we have all these great discoveries uh, and um, clearly uh, the gap between the uh, lab and the clinic is, is, is narrowing. We recognize that our research is increasingly interdisciplinary and that we have now the capacity to implement and apply all these new technologies. Uh, uh, so I think that's important. And there is also a theme here is that there is increasingly team science approach to cancer. And I think the standard to cancer is a good example of uh, this approach. And I think it is obvious to this audience that we understand increasingly the, 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 the wire and diagram uh, uh, of, the, of, of, of the cancer cells. And clearly the promise here is the uh, go in the direction of the right drug uh, for the uh, right uh, tumor. And I think we are here at an unbelievable um, uh, uh, situation. I think what's happening in Boston and what's happening in particular at the MGH uh, is, is fascinating. So the stories continue to pile up um, in addition to the well-known story with the EGF receptor uh, mutation and, and, and uh, EGFR tertiary kinase inhibitors. Uh, you've seen the story uh, last week in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, with ALK and also the story uh, emerging in BRAF and melanoma. So clearly, I think uh, there are increasing examples that uh, this is uh, a, a definitely a, a possibility to advance in this direction. And we have hundreds of new anti-cancer agents. We have the need to match the right drug to the individual uh, patient. And we have a dual challenge, which is to understand better the genetics of each cancer and then change the way in which we test uh, new drugs. And I mentioned already some of the examples and some of the examples have been mentioned. So this is just a laundry list of the agents. Uh, the point of this slide is that we are not gonna get bored 
um, with, uh, for lack of ideas. So sometimes when it happens, when you have some of these fellows come to you and say, I am very worried in whether I will have an opportunity to contribute, what do you think? And you look at them and say, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, you know, we, we need 50 like you. Uh, so I think this is uh, clearly the, the thing. Now, matching the right drug uh, with the right cancer, I think uh, uh, clearly, uh, this morning we heard about the cell line encyclopedia, and, and here uh, I'd like to uh, show you um, the concept that Cheryl Burns is uh, conducting uh, at MGH with the Center for Molecular Therapeutics. And I think clearly these robotic screens of a large database of, of cell lines for drug sensitivity and then identify biomarkers for clinical trials is uh, critically important. It worked beautifully uh, for ALK and it's going to work uh, hopefully uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the same way for many other agents. So we can, based on screens and also I think the concept of developing screens based on primary tumors growing in mice is also very, very important. But we have these screens, we'll have perhaps the right idea, we will kind of guess which drugs can work better uh, against which types. But I think what's critically important is the concept of testing the each uh, patient a tumor for the right biomarker of response and uh, for the right uh, genotype. And that's why it's important that we genotype every cancer in real time. And I think this today means snapshot. It will mean other things with new sequence, with next sequence a few months from now. Uh, but I think the important thing is that we should make as a community a commitment to make sure that we genotype every single tumor um, that we come across in the clinic before we offer therapies because I think that's uh, clearly um, uh, uh, the best opportunity we have to offer the best approach to every one of our patients. And then the importance of monitoring uh, tumors during therapy and this is going to be uh, uh, fascinating. Uh, there are many platforms. I am particularly very excited about the platform that, uh, uh, that Daniel Haver and, 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 and Tom Member are putting together, the Secreting Tumor Cell Platform, with its multiple versions. I think now every time this is like uh, this, the days of the jukeboxes, they keep on getting smaller and they play better. Uh, so, but the promise of bringing this technology to the, to the, to, to, to the clinic uh, I think it makes us all uh, very excited. And this is uh, work um, that was published uh, a few years ago. And the point here is that you can, in the blood, identify mutations uh, that occur even before the patients have failed uh, from a specific therapy. So I think this opportunity of monitoring is absolutely, uh, is absolutely fascinating, and we should incorporate that into clinical trials. We should not forget about developing classical tumor biomarkers. This morning, there was a question that was, I think, important, and the reply also is that we need to make sure that we are hitting well our targets, and therefore, we need to develop biomarkers in clinical trials. This is a, um, an example that, uh, this is an inhibitor from, um, uh, from Genentech. It's an AKT inhibitor that we work in, in the lab um, uh, and in the clinic, and very active against uh, cells that have uh, P10, P10 loss, and uh, I think our challenge will be when we go in the clinic, these compounds will have toxicities. Uh, again, it's not going to be like, like, like Liebeck. Uh, we're going to hit hyperglycemia. We're going to hit other issues. So I think it's important to develop biomarkers that tell us whether are we hitting the pathway hard enough or not. Even the chemistry is a good way to do it, but it's difficult to quantify. Uh, I think we can think of other platforms uh, here on the right, you have using uh, a reverse protein phase arrays in which you can quantify better inhibition of the pathway, in this case, uh, phospho S6 and phospho uh, EIF4G with this AKT inhibitor. But um, I'm not giving up also on immunohistochemistry. I think that you can develop platforms that you can quantify. We have been working with a platform that David Dream developed called Aqua, in which um, it's using an immunofluorescence. Um, it multi allows for multiplexing. You can you can um, uh, stain more than one antigen. And uh, here, uh, the point of this slide is that uh, looking at KS67, uh, there is a very tight correlation uh, between 
our results with uh, traverse uh, protein uh, uh, phase assays and, and aqua. And also the beauty, I think, of having platforms that are based on immunostochemistry is that you can also address issues such as switches in in, uh, in cellular localization. So in this case, for example, uh, uh, FOXO um, uh, um, be becomes uh, dephosphorylated and there is a switch on FOXO from the cytoplasm to the nuclei that can also be scored potentially and quantified as a, as, as, as a, as a biomarker. So I think uh, we still have to learn a lot about morphology. And the last point that I'd like to make in terms of the need to, to establish technology to support clinical research is the importance of incorporating uh, functional imaging. So the mice on the left, the, the mouse on the left is probably the best known mouse I've seen in a long time. And we, should, we should ask Jeff to, to nominate this. This mouse should have a name, you know? I don't know if, but we should call, I don't know, um, whatever, Jim. Uh, Jim the, my, the mouse, the famous. Uh, but um, uh, I think what's nice, though, is that the preclinical model that Jeff developed um, with the imaging folks here at MGH uh, then was correlated in the clinic. So on the right, you have images from a patient of our phase one clinical trial with BEZ, and we basically saw the same. So I think this is uh, very uh, exciting, and that's why we should really try to incorporate our imaging colleagues early on into clinical uh, uh, development. Now, what does it mean in terms of what do we have to do um, in the designing of these uh, novel uh, clinical trials? I think the first point is that we'll have to go into smaller smarter clinical trials, and hopefully they will provide the answer. In breast cancer, clearly we cannot continue to afford to have 8,000 um, patient clinical trials. That's too much, and, and I think uh, we have to be smarter, and we are very excited about the neoadjuvant approach in which you can take a much uh, smaller population, and for as long as you have robust biomarkers of clinical benefit, you are okay. So you could select your patient population based on genomics, or on specific genetic background, or based on other markers, and then you can randomize patients to receive these experimental therapies, and you can follow them by imaging. Now, the people are asking in the field of breast cancer, is this doable? Well, I think it is. Look at HER2. Uh, this is the largest neoadjuvant trial in HER2 positive breast cancer that we published last year, actually this year, in The Lancet. Uh, large study, but much smaller than the adjuvant studies. And the point here is not the chemotherapy, which is a complex European regime, as all the European regimes seem to be. Uh, but the important thing is that one arm has trastuzumab on it and the other does not. The primary study endpoint of this study was pathological CR rate. And you have the data here, you have two definitions. I would like to, um, you can use any one we like, we can use the one in the right. And what you can see is that in the Herceptin containing arm, the response, the pathological response rate, and that's total pathological response, doubled. Doubled in the combination arm. So clinical benefit in this. And the question is, how does this correlate with progression fee survival, which is the primary endpoint that we are using in our large adjuvant trials? And the answer is that it correlates very tightly. So this study, I think, is the first one um, that had correlation between progression fee survival and pathological CR rate. So I think now uh, we are in a position to study new HER2 agents in the neoadjuvant setting. And I'm very happy to see here in the audience uh, Maria Koller, uh, who was instrumental in moving forward the concept uh, of studying a new anti-HER2 agent. This is the NEO-ALTO study. This study is a companion to the large ALTO study. The ALTO study, 8,000 patients. This study, 450 patients. Lapatinib, trastuzumab, or the combination of both. This study had mandatory tumor biopsies on day 15, and also a mandatory cohort of patients had PET scan uh, at the same time that we did the biopsies. So we have correlates with biopsy data and PET scan uh, data. We were able to achieve good sample quality in over 
93 or 94 percent of cases, and this was a large multi-centric trial. This trial will be presented as part of a plenary session uh, at the San Antonio uh, meeting uh, in uh, December. Second, and I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll quickly, uh, the issue of, of combinations. Um, you've heard about compensatory pathways. You've heard that the activity with mTOR inhibitors is there, but is not very solid, and that the potential reason for that is because cancer cells have these compensatory pathways that are activated. A very important one in luminal B breast cancer is um, mediated via the activation of the insulin-like growth factor receptor. And we had published that initially with Neil uh, Drosen. And then we went on and did a phase one clinical trial in patients with the combination, and we began to see responses. This was an oral presentation at ASCO last year. And please draw your attention to the yellow line. These are the patients in the phase one study that had luminal B breast cancer, what we call the ER high proliferation. We saw responses by classic Rusis criteria. We saw tumor market responses. We saw prolonged PFS, and we saw PET scan responses. So clearly, this combination has very, very high activity in the phase one setting. And I think we are now uh, moving, no, I think I'm, I'm, we're now moving ahead, and we're doing a large randomized phase two study. Now, this feedback loop that we saw with IGF receptor is going to be totally context dependent. For example, we have worked now um, in, um, in, 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 in HER2 cell lines in which uh, we also, when we block with the PI3 kinase inhibitor, we see activation of ERK. And now we have seen that this is mediated uh, via um, uh, HER2 phosphorylation. And that is probably uh, HER3 mediated. So uh, these compensatory pathways are going to be there also with the PI3 kinase inhibitors. And that's uh, the rationale to explore that. This applies also in lung cancer with EGF receptor. That's work uh, by Jeff Engelman. And then the IGF receptor story, I already uh, show it to you. And I think the importance of understanding that these receptor tyrosine kinase play a role is important because although we are doing, as in the right, clinical trials blocking PI3 kinase uh, with PI3 kinase inhibitors and with MEK inhibitors, we don't know whether the side effects of these combinations are going to be too bad. We don't know whether skin rise, for example, will be a limiting toxicity. And there's another way that perhaps is equally smart, and is that to block the receptor and block PI3 kinase. And actually, uh, we are involved in a clinical trial with BEZ235 uh, and trastuzumab. We are enrolling patients, and uh, this is something that uh, could be uh, very fruitful. And then the last point is, it has been mentioned already, study of resistance will be very important. Uh, we uh, are working uh, with several collaborations, including uh, uh, Bill Hahn uh, on mechanisms of resistance uh, to the PI3 kinase pathway. So again, even before the agents are in, uh, uh, in, in, in further develop, I think it's important to identify this resistance. So I think um, we are shaping a very exciting future in the way uh, we treat uh, cancer. And uh, this is already happening today. I think it's important to bring on board all this technology, all these platforms, and try to make a more uh, rational approach to the way uh, we treat our, our patients. So I'd like to finish by acknowledging uh, the people. Um, I've shown data on the PA3 kinase trials, and these are the institutions that were participating uh, with us. I'd like to uh, thank uh, John Mendelson and, and Larry Norton, who were my mentors, and then at Memorial, and then Neil Rosen, whom we have been collaborating, all of our uh, industry uh, collaborators in these in this, uh, clinical uh, uh, trials. This is the lab uh, in uh, Barcelona. You'll recognize some of them because uh, the second on your left, Maury, is in Boston, and Pete, hiding here, is coming to Boston as well. Uh, and, and then, of course, you know uh, Giuseppe Tabernero well, who is conducting all our uh, phase um, uh, one uh, clinical trials. And I have one final slide. I know that Boston is a city of excellence in many fronts, I know you have the best baseball team in the world, that I learned, that you have the best football team in the world, that I learned, <laughs> but what you don't have is the best soccer team in the world. <laughs> and this is our stadium, uh, the Barcelona football team. They threw me a football party 
in the field. So this is the uh, BO team. And so this is, for you that follow soccer, Barcelona is clearly the best. This is a neutral observation. It's not, it's not biased. <laughs> uh, uh, looking at the numbers of um, championships that we won in the last uh, 10 years. But I think what's important is uh, the motto of the club that is in Catalan, um, means uh, Mescan Club, which means that we are more than a team. And I think um, this is something that I'm really looking forward to build in Boston. Uh, we have all these amazing institutions, this amazing capacity, and we should be clearly more than a team. Thank you very much. <laughs>